The Downtown DC Bid is a nonprofit that was founded in 1997. Uh, and our business improvement district area comprises 138 city blocks in what is the region's main employment hub. Uh, the bid serves its members through providing capital improvement, resources and research, as well as the promotion of public-private uh, partnerships. We felt that to, to do this today, uh, the reason why we're doing this today is because the, the bid has been, or is the home of the Walt E. Washington Convention Center, the Capital One Arena, world class museums and theaters, hundreds of shops and restaurants, and about 150 million square feet of office space. Our 33 hotels have just under 12,000 rooms, representing 35% of the district's total hotel rooms and 40% of the city's hotel revenues and hotel sales tax revenues. Just last year, our downtown DC hotel market was the fourth best performing in the US after New York City, Boston, and San Francisco. And performance in early 2020 indicated we were headed for another strong year of hotel revenues and demand. Needless to say, the coronavirus pandemic has changed the market swiftly and significantly. In the downtown bids, 56% of hotel rooms are closed and DC hotels are to today operating with revenues of only 5% or less than they generated this time last year. So we wanted to bring you a conversation among experienced hoteliers and experts to provide a discussion focused on the historical strength of the DC market and set on a set of unique perspectives, resources and information, as well as a forum to answer questions that you might have. So moderating today is Elliot Ferguson. Elliot is the president and CEO of Destination DC. Uh, Elliot is a 30 year veteran of the travel and hospitality industry and leads Destination DC's effort to generate economic opportunity for the district through meetings and tourism. Before uh, coming to um, events DC, Destination DC, Elliot worked uh, in Atlanta and also in Savannah, Georgia. Elliot serves as the national chair of the board of directors for the US Travel Association, the advisory board of the Smithsonian National Zoo, DC Jazz Festival, and the United Way of the National Capital Area. So Elliot, thanks for agreeing to be the moderator and I'm gonna turn it over to you. This panel together. Um, you know, I think that the one thing that we cannot say any, anymore is that uh, this is normal. I refuse to say that this is the new norm. I'd say that this is a, a massive uh, dip in the road in terms of our industry. Um, but, you know, the reality is, as I serve in a capacity of uh, the mayor's Reopen DC campaign, we always start by looking at the impact of COVID-19 on our community and, of course, the health crisis that's associated with it. I think in my role, and as you saw, maybe the, um, the press conference that the mayor allowed us to participate with her on yesterday during National Travel and Tourism Week, it's all about recognizing where we are as an industry, but equally as much focusing on our future uh, and really the economic impact of this industry as a whole. So um, happy to be here, happy to be able to moderate with you know owner operator groups and as well as as as. Um, individuals that focus, uh, Kelsey, with STR and the data that's so important to us. Now, as you know, our, our community is extremely important. And yesterday we talked about the economic impact overall and where we are with numbers. And last year we saw about 22.8 million visitors come to the city, $8.2 billion in spending and over $896 million in hotel taxes generated that uh, this city can use to promote and market DC as a destination. As we look at these numbers, specifically the hotel taxes, I, a lot of folks ask about our organization. We are a private nonprofit working closely with the city, Events DC, and our members that include uh, those that are on the call as their hotels are members. But we get less than 1% of the hotel tax that makes up 80% of our annual operating budget. Um, as we look at um, what we do at the end of the day, it's economic impact. The reality for us is that unlike DEMPED and other organizations that are looking at industry relocating here. We're looking at people coming to the city for three or five days, getting the heck out of here, and then more coming and spending more money in the city. So that void right now is being felt significantly. As we look at this, the impact of the coronavirus 
uh, on, on, on our industry right now, it's, it's perceived to be nine times worse than 9-11 in terms of the, in, the negative impact as we've lost over 8 million jobs nationwide. And this is data based on the US Travel Association. And I remember very well moving here in December 2001, just a few months after 9-11, and folks are asking me, what the heck are you doing? Why are you moving? And I'm like, you know, this, we will get out of this and we'll see better days ahead. Um, and, and we did see that. It took 10 years for us to gain market share, but we did regain that market share. Uh, as we look at what COVID has done to our community uh, and our industry here in Washington, D.C., we're looking at $1.7 billion lost in, uh, in dollars from travel spending, 71% decline from last year, and $78 million to date lost in hotel taxes. So, um, you know, from, when you look at visitor spending and, and those losses, clearly the mayor, all of our stakeholders, and those that are on the call, the others that are part of this panel are looking at recovery uh, as soon as possible. Uh, that does not even account for the fact that as we look at citywide conventions and our organization is responsible for bringing those conventions to the convention center, revenue is down about 87% and we've lost about $163 million in revenue from citywide since 22 groups have opted not to come to Washington. So as, you, uh, as we look at that overall revenue that's down, we're down about $305 million overall. So the first picture you saw of me uh, with, with everyone else, you saw me against a brick wall, and that's kind of how we feel right now as we look at where we are in this industry. Um, in my role with the U.S. Travel Association, I do serve as chair, and we are focusing on all things tied to recovery and making sure that our elected officials understand the importance and the impact of our industry and, and don't marginalize the jobs that are created at the lower levels because you're really op creating opportunities for folks that that uh, may not uh, be employable for a variety of reasons. So it's extremely important that we get that financial relief. Um, selfishly, as a 501c6 organization is not being able to take part in PPP or CARES Act 1 or 2. So we're, we're lobbying on for that as well. So our conversation today will be focusing on a lot of things tied to recovery, uh, briefly looking at the past, but also talking about our future. Now, the Hotel Association, Restaurant Association, and Events DC, we're kind of all part of a consortium that deals with all things hospitality. And Solomon Keene could not be on the call today, but we know that the Hotel Association is focusing on a myriad of things that are important to not only the stakeholders that are on the call, but everyone else, um, including hospitality relief in the terms of uh, real estate property tax deferrals for at least 90 days, which they were successful in doing that all things with alcohol and, and, and um, beverage um, administration changes and things that need to be um, moved in terms of approving deadlines and, and really focusing on all efforts tied to protecting their members, which are the hoteliers. And I know that Kathy Hollinger with the Restaurant Association is doing some of the same things in a similar regard. So we work closely together to focus on things that make our, to keep our industry whole uh, and to make sure that we have the necessary dollars so that we compete against cities that have larger budgets to promote themselves as well as state organizations um, like state tourism boards that also focus on promoting the destinations. So the robust panel today um, that we have with Norm Jenkins, uh, with, with John Bortz and Kel Kelsey uh, with STR will be able to give you additional insight as to some of the things that we will be fo focusing on. We're gonna talk about our performance uh, in 2019 as a whole, uh, the, the performance of hotels where we should be uh, and what we want to see happen as we move forward. And of course, the strengths of our market, which Neil referenced some of them um, as we talk about our destination from tourism, monuments, memorials and museums, but also nightlife theater, um, fine dining, uh, and all other things in which we, we promote on a regular basis. So. You know, as we look at the questions, they are specific um, to, to all the panelists, but the first one, um, it would be for everyone to think about and maybe give me an answer. And as we look at moving forward with the restrictions that are currently in place with the emergency, um, what do you all think um, will, will possibly happen as we look at next steps in terms of reopening and, and possibly going returning to some degree of normalcy? I know that uh, we've heard of certain chains working with Clorox and with Lysol in terms of the, the standards that need to be in place in terms of uh, consumer confidence. So I'm curious from you all's perspective, can you give us some insight as to some of the things that you all are thinking about? 
Norm, you want to start? I'm muted. Let's see here. Uh, you're good now. Good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there are a, a number of changes that are that are going to occur and are already occurring. I think operationally, uh, you know, things like the check-in process uh, that we know today, that's that's going to change. For the past, I guess, two years, uh, hotel owners have been investing in uh, mobile check-in tools, and I think that's going to be more of the norm where you won't have a lot of interaction at, at check-in. I think you're going to see uh, less uh, – uh, cleaning of, of, of rooms during uh, during room turns and and uh, once you check in that's it and someone will clean the room uh, once you leave I think there's going to be a lot more of, of that type of uh, work you're going to see more prepackaged foods less restaurants uh, it, it's it's going to be a, a, a different environment but but getting back to the earlier point I think you touched on getting back to, to, to a normal state um, I, I don't anticipate a, a normal state until we, we have a, uh, a widely available medical solution, a vaccine, before people are going to get comfortable traveling, at least in the convention space. I think the smaller hotels, uh, you know, but leisure travel will lead, but I think the uh, big conventions, large groups are, are going to lag until there's a, a meaningful, widely available vaccine. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, <clears throat> Norm. Um, but I, I do think it's going to be very different on the other side of it. Having gone through a couple of prior uh, crises, 9-11, uh, post-9-11, um, the Lehman crash, the Great Recession, uh, our, our industry is going to change. It's, um, you know, interestingly, we're going to go from a high touch industry to a low touch or no touch industry. Um, we, we've got to figure out um, how to do all these things without not only touching the guests, but our associates um, uh, staying apart. We, uh, I, as Norm mentioned, um, food and beverage is going to change dramatically. And, and I think uh, some temporarily, but some permanently. Uh, I think the traditional uh, in-room dining uh, we pro will probably go away and never come back again. Um, people have gotten used to using apps for delivery and curbside uh, pickup. I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that um, in, in the hotels. I think uh, we'll see a lot more prep for banquets and caterings and less cooking uh, at the end of the day and, and probably for good in terms of healthy food, uh, more healthy food, fr probably fresher foods uh, at the end of the day, maybe more personalized where you uh, you have a, a 50 people, ultimately when we have groups of 50 people again and, and people order the kind of salad that they want with the protein they want, just like you do at a fast serve restaurant and that's what comes out of the, the banquet kitchen and gets delivered. So we'll, we'll, op we're, we'll, ha we'll have to operate our hotels with fewer people, um, greater use of technology uh, on the other side of this. Uh, and again, not just for the transitionary period here until there's a health solution, but I think on a permanent basis. I mean, interestingly, if you, I've been in the business since the mid, early to mid nineties, uh, every year we operate our hotels with fewer people, uh, uh, fewer hours at the end of the day. And, and, uh, there is a saying, uh, don't, don't let a disaster go to waste. Um, <laughs> but, you know, things get transformed. You move, you move forward because of necessity uh, at the end of the day. Um, it's going to take a while for our customer base to come back. Um, Nor mentioned the groups. Uh, we were talking the other day. We've told our teams at our 54 hotels, of which 80% of our properties are in major cities in the U.S., don't assume any of the group that's on the books happens this year. Right. Um, and, and frankly, don't expect anything that was on the books for transit to happen either. Those bookings were made under different circumstances. So let's monitor a, a go forward gross uh, new bookings. Um, those are people booking, understanding the environment and the circumstances in most cases. And, and so I think when we, when we reopen and we have four hotels in the district, they're still closed. Now, two of them are under renovations. 
um, and we'll reopen those when it's the right time to reopen. We think that's le it, it's still months away, it's not weeks away. And uh, we have 54 hotels in the US, 46 are closed. Um, it's unimaginable, frankly. Um, and, and so it's gonna be different on the other side. Uh, the business will come back. I hear a lot of people saying, you know, travel's gonna be different and everybody's gonna work at home and, you know, hasn't it been wonderful working at home? And uh, the, my answer is I, if I could invest in a divorce attorney business right now, um, I think there's gonna be a boom in that, uh, <laughs> following yeah. everybody working from home. Yeah, I, I think the answer is only yes when your family is around you. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I think you're making some valid points. And in my haste to jump right into the questions, because we've got such limited time, I did not allow the three of you to introduce yourselves. So if you could briefly, and Kelsey, we'll start with you, uh, tell us who you are and what you do with SGR, and then John and Norm. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey Finnerty. I am a research analyst with STR. If you're a hotelier, you are probably aware of us. We do hotel data, and I sit in the research and development department. I speak about data, I write about data, and I've started working with alternative accommodations as well. Thanks. Excellent. And uh, I'm John Bortz. I'm, I'm chair and CEO of Pebblebrook Hotel Trust, which is a public lodging REIT uh, with hotels, uh, primarily major cities on the two coasts, and and resort markets uh, in the U.S. I also uh, <laughs> I have the honor of being a chair, sort of like Elliot. Uh, we won the lottery this year. I'm chair of AHLA, um, and so uh, uh, a little extra time uh, involved uh, there. So uh, in my part time, I get to I get to work for Pebblebrook. And uh, I'm Norm Jenkins. I'm president of. Capstone Development. Capstone is a privately held uh, hospitality uh, acquisition and development company. We own 30 hotels in 11 states in the District of Columbia. And, and thank you all again. And I think selfishly, we always think that, you know, John and, and Norm, you all are always focusing on DC, but the reality is you're not. And John, I appreciate uh, the marketing that you're doing in the background of some of your product. But um, <laughs> as you look at uh, Washington is a destination and specifically the hotels that you have here in the, in the district. And, and um, some of the things that Neil was saying, was saying earlier was the strength of downtown Washington and the fact that DC bid really uh, has a lot of inventory and real estate tied to our market. Why do you think for the last 10 years DC has been such a, a, a strong market for you and why do you all continue to invest uh, in this market? <laughs> so you might not like my answer. Um, All right, let's see. But, but, but I'm going to fire things up a little bit. You know, I, I guess it depends on one's definition. Uh, from an investor perspective, while uh, this is one of the higher uh, ADR occupancy and rev par markets in the country, um, it's been one of our worst markets over the last 10 years. Uh, it's one of the weakest recoveries since the last downturn. Um, we've had you know, very, very little growth overall in the market. And of, of all the major markets, all the major cities in the US, you know, probably only New York City and uh, Chicago uh, rank below Washington in terms of the, the growth in RevPAR over the last 10 years, as well as EBITDA growth. I mean, it's one of the weakest recovery markets that we've been in. And, uh, and, and so for us, we've actually been investing in the market, particularly following the, the acquisition of LaSalle, where we picked up a, an additional significant number of properties in the market. So while we, we love DC and we love the, what we call the multi-legged stool, you have great convention business here, you've got uh, incredible leisure business in this market, you have, you have decent corporate growth, but supplemented by government uh, in this market. It tends to be more predictable and a little less volatile than other major markets in the US. But its growth, because it hasn't been participating like other major markets in the creative industry growth that's been going on in the last 10 years, its, it's uh, revenue growth and its bottom line growth has been very subpar. But would you also, as you make those statements, 
I mean, you, so, those who may not be in the industry might think, well, then why the heck are you here? And, uh, and, uh, and, and when you're really talking about New York and Chicago, you're talking about strong markets that have done well for a long, long time, but you're also looking at as the other markets that perhaps you're investing in are now catching up. Wouldn't you agree that um, there is some stability in the market here and, and there's a reason why even with what you just stated that we still remain a very strong market for your portfolio? Yeah, and I, I think that's right, Elliot, and it's why we're not gonna leave the market. We've, we've about halved our position in the market. We went from about 11% of our EBITDA down to a, a, a little over five. Of course, that was when we actually had EBITDA uh, pre-crisis. Uh, but off of last year's numbers, uh, over, over the period from the end of November of 2018 up until March, this, this past March, two months ago, we've reduced our position in the market by half. But we do still want to be here. Um, we, we, we do like the market. Um, we hope the next 10 years maybe reverses a little bit, the underperformance of the past 10 years. I mean, the one thing we figured out we're not very good at is forecasting individual market performance from year to year. We're pretty good at forecasting the industry overall because everything kind of averages out uh, at the end of the day. And you can look at the bigger macro stats that drive it. But local markets are driven by so many different variables um, from year to year. Um, it's really hard to forecast, you know, e even even near term performance in, in a lot of markets. So um, we we like the fact that we think over the long term supply will continue to be reasonably uh, held in check, although the last five years have been uh, pretty challenging, uh, particularly with the development down on the wharf and around the edges by the ballpark in Noma, these other markets that maybe don't directly compete, but ultimately beds are beds and people are choosing to go to those sub-markets instead of perhaps being in, in the downtown market. So we still like the market, but I would tell you it's, it continues to be further down on our list of, of attractive markets. Yeah. Okay. So we, we, we actually, uh, we like DC. Um, not love, but we, we, we like the market. DC is, is as John mentioned, is, uh, is very predictable. Um, you, you know, the, it, unlike New York, New York will have very high highs, but their lows get pretty low. DC stays in, 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 a, in, a, in a relatively stable range, so we, we like that. Uh, a very predictable uh, uh, convention market, very predictable uh, leisure market. Uh, up until I guess next year, we had a, you know every four years you can bank on a, a big a big boost from the inauguration. Uh, also, uh, we develop in D.C., and, and the fact that Washington has always had uh, relatively high barriers to entry, it's hard building here, it's a process, and it's not for the faint of heart. So if you can get something built, you're in on a good basis, and you can generally do uh, pretty well. Now, look, we, we own another market's national. We've owned a national for five years. It's been a white hot, mar white hot market. D.C. Uh, doesn't come close to delivering the type of returns on invested capital we, we've generated there. But again, uh, given the basis we're in in Washington, uh, very stable, very predictable. We're, we're, we're a believer in Washington and we'll continue to be. Excellent. That's, that's good to hear. And I take both, both your comments in the right vein. And, and I know that we always start our work to do in terms of bringing more business to the city. And talking about market share and rev par and all those numbers, all, the, all that, that information that's really key to our industry, you know, now that we have um, been dealing with the pandemic and the, the um, effects of the pandemic on our industry, there is a reality here. And um, we'll, we'll get to Kelsey shortly, but as we're looking at our future, you know, and, we're, and you all are, are doing your predictions and you're talking to uh, folks like SGR and everyone else in your own shop, what do you think it's gonna take for us to get back to the numbers that we were experiencing in, uh, for the last few years uh, and how long do you think it will take in terms of recovery? Yeah, yeah I, I, I guess I had kind of jumped the gun earlier and I talked about when we get back. Um, it, it's going to be a while, particularly on the, on the convention side. I, I don't think we, we uh, get back to normal travel pattern, at least from a, a big group perspective, until you have a, a widely uh, available vaccine. 
uh, and that, that could be a while. So if someone comes up with a vaccine in, in 12 or 15 months, it might not be wide, widely available for another three years. So it, it could take that long for, uh, for travel to come back. Um, so I'm, I'm, I like to think of myself an optimist, but with respect to the recovery, uh, a little less so. Uh, when we typically have these significant downturns, generally business you know, brings back demand, but uh, in this instance, I think you're gonna see you know, hotels that are you know, less than 200 rooms that are gonna be more focused on uh, leisure travel, regional travel, those hotels are, are gonna lead this recovery, in, in my opinion. Uh, not the big group houses. And, and to John's point, I think that the way we travel, the way we uh, 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 meet in groups, yeah, we're going to experience some changes and those changes will, will be permanent. So uh, uh, I, I can't put a, a nice rosy picture on, on the recovery. It's going to be a tough one. Yeah. And I, I figured um, that would be the case. And John, you probably will answer the same, but I am curious before you do answer with some of the, with PPP and all of the other, um, uh, ways that are things that are out there to help you with recovery, John. Have you and your company been able to 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 take advantage of some of the 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 opportunities that are there as we're looking at recovery? Um, the answer is no. Um, we, uh, you know, as chair of HLA, I've been very actively involved with adv advocating for the industry, and and I do think the Care Cares Act provides great benefits for the workers, for our employees. That was our number one objective in, in our advocacy. The second um, was to keep the businesses around long enough so that they could rehire uh, the employees. That was the objective of the PPP program, but there are two main obstacles. One is um, what was intended to be or thought to be a relatively short period of time for this virus to pass through um, the, the program provides, provides for about eight weeks of assistance, most of which goes to the workers, which is really just replacing the unemployment insurance program. So th that program, while it does help a lot of smaller hotel owners, it's pretty limited benefit because it doesn't get very far uh, into paying your other fixed costs, like your debt service, um, like your real estate taxes, um, uh, like your utilities, like your insurance, which, you know, continues to increase in, in cost. And so um, I, the, the issue that I see about why this recovery is going to take so long is because there's going to be a lot of damage done to the economy. Uh, I can tell you for Pebble Brook, we'll get through this, but we're going to come out of this probably with three or four hundred million dollars more in debt. Um, from the burn rate of, of owning hotels, um, even when they're closed and paying all of the costs involved, whether it's your skeleton crew of people, whether it's health insurance for all your employees, uh, which we've been doing um, and which we think is the right thing to do, or whether it's um, uh, meeting your interest obligations, um, it, it, you're going to see a lot of damage done not only to the hotel industry, but to almost any industry that involved human touch and that's been shut down uh, at the end of the day um, by governmental regulation. So we can solve this or limit this, this health crisis, but it's created an economic crisis that doesn't go away in eight weeks. Um, as Norm said, it's gonna be around for a while. And I have a little more positive attitude about uh, not necessarily how long it's going to take, because I think we don't get back to 19 for another four or five years, um, at least three probably, and more likely four or five. But I do think there'll be a medical solution, or it's just going to disappear. I mean, interestingly, both the, 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 the 1918 Spanish flu and the 57, 58 um, uh, Asian flus, they, they did just go away. They didn't they came back, but they had mutated into something that was uh, not fatal. And so I don't think any of us know what's going to happen. Not, certainly nobody here is a scientist uh, or an epidemiologist or what, whatever else involved. But I, but I do think 
there's a lot of damage being done to the economy. There's a lot of leverage um, that's being created. The Fed's doing an incredible job keeping the markets um, filled with liquidity. That's incredibly helpful and limiting the economic damage. And, and, and even government is doing an incredible job with fiscal stimulus. But when you, when you think about how everybody's going to get through this, in, in every case, it's going to be by taking on more debt. And that's going to limit capital expenditures, growth, and, and all the good things we like. We're, we're going to be in a recession, I think, for a while, even though technically we'll have GDP growth, because we're going to come off a period of minus 40% or something GDP here in the second quarter. Fair enough. Um, and we're, I'm going to get back to you with that question, with a similar question, Norm, but I did want to, to switch uh, over to Kelsey and the research that's so important to all of us. And, you know, we normally are relatively excited to get the data <laughs> and see how well we're doing and, and, and base our budgets on where we're going and, Right now, it's almost like opening your 401k. I just shred it right away and, and uh, just hope for a better day. So Kelsey, uh, we'd love to turn it over to you and because SGR is so important to our industry and give some insight from your, from your industry, your, your, your side of the industry. Thanks, Elliot. Let me go ahead and share my screen. I have some slides to demonstrate what's happening in DC and elsewhere. Let's see, there we go, presentation view. So let's see, just to start, this is revenue per available room, RevPAR year-over-year -year growth for the 12 months ending February 2020. That was the last month before we really started seeing very widespread uh, COVID impacts. And this is our top 25 markets. You can see Washington, D.C. is highlighted in pink, 2% RevPAR growth year-over-year which might not sound amazing, but if you will recall, prior to COVID, we were about 10 years into an up cycle, and we were really starting to enter a period of low, slow growth, and there was actually a lot of talk about whether or not a downturn is coming. Well, do we need an event to precipitate a downturn? Um, I think all of that's gone out the window now, but just to give you an idea of where we were, and just to say that DC is in this position in that top half of the top 25, pretty much most of the past five years, um, really lower than average supply growth, about 1.5 to 1.6% supply growth in the market um, compared to 2% nationally over that period. However, the central business district did have much higher supply growth, closer to 3.5%, just to put some perspective there. And the next month, now this is March uh, monthly, rev par percent change, and you can see just how quickly things shifted. Washington DC is now no longer in the top half of the top 25 down towards the bottom. This could be because, and I think our other panelists have touched on it, DC is a very convention heavy, business heavy market. And while it took until about mid-March to really start seeing travel stop completely, a lot of companies implemented travel restrictions and travel bans back in the first very beginning of the month. And that no doubt hurt DC a little bit more than some of these more leisure heavy markets like Tampa, Norfolk, um, Oahu Island. And where are we today? Uh, this is our weekly data. We've taken to looking at weekly data because the situation is changing so rapidly. And this is for the week ending May 2nd, rev par percent change. And just to give you some context here for Washington, D.C., following uh, the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks, um, RevPAR fell about 60.4% the following week. The week after that, it was down about 40%, then 30 then 20 So it was down, but there were definite signs of recovery. Washington, D.C. has been in about this negative 80-something percent RevPAR decline for seven straight weeks now. So we're definitely at the bottom and we will get out. This isn't obviously, as Elliot said, this is not going to be the norm forever. Uh, we will get out, but it, we are still at the bottom right now, largely due to the lockdowns. Here we have hotel occupancy. And I think a couple of things to take away here. We've got the 33 business improvement district hotels, the central business district as a, as a whole, the Washington DC market and the total US market. First, you can see that in the first half of the year, we have this great wave pattern, that day of week, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, business travelers, 
Friday, Saturday leisure travelers. That's not really happening so much anymore in a COVID world. There's no normal travel pattern. And secondly, you see that total US and the DC wider market are performing a lot better than those downtown hotels. And I do have one or two more slides that I think demonstrate why this is happening. First, the first reason why this is happening is that we generally are seeing suburban submarkets do better than urban markets. This is definitely true among DC's 10 submarkets, but it's also true across the wider US. This could be due to the idea of escapism. You want to leave the city, go where it's maybe quote unquote safer. It could be due to maybe relative affordability. It might be less expensive to stay in suburban Virginia than in the CBD. Mm -hmm. And it could be due to things like interstate hotels uh, or airport hotels where we are seeing some demand remain. And the last slide I will leave you with, and the real reason that these CBD hotels are have struggling so much is very largely due to class makeup. About 80% of rooms in Washington DC's business improvement district fall in the luxury and upper upscale classes. And those classes are having the hardest time because there is no business travel. So why are the mid-scale and economy classes doing so well in comparison? Uh, two primary reasons STR thinks for that. The first, of course, is the relative affordability. As disposable income falls, so does your ability to purchase, you know, $400 a night luxury hotel room. And the second is the preponderance of extended stay hotels in the lower classes. We tend to see a lot more extended stay hotels there and extended stay hotels are actually performing really well, likely because again, we don't have travel as we know it. We have people self-isolating, we have healthcare workers, construction workers, people moving, things of that nature, who all might need a longer stay and who all might really appreciate a kitchen, especially given the current situation and you can't just go out to eat at a restaurant like normal. So I hope this provides a little bit of context as to Washington, D.C., where we are today. And I'll give it back over to you, Elliot. All right, Kelsey. Um, morbid but accurate in terms of where we are. Um, and I, you know, I think the reality is, for those that are not in the industry is that normally those numbers, you, these numbers are being influenced by what is going on now. If you looked at this data a year ago, it would, it would uh, you know, this is a peak season for D.C. normally. So uh, Kelsey, from your perspective, when you all are thinking recovery, and you know, I'm sure everyone wants you to look into your crystal ball and tell us that it's going to be okay and we're all going to wake up from this. But you know, what what type of advice and or uh, guidance are you all offering or suggesting in terms of what we're seeing? You know, one one report I, I saw stated that in 2021 we may be back to about 80% of where we should be, um, and and I'm kind of curious. What are you all seeing or what are you all thinking and telling folks right now at this point? So right now, we are working on revising our forecast for the third time this year. Um, okay. We had our forecast come out pre-COVID, so then we revised it. Now we're revising again. With that said, as of March 30th, we were forecasting, um, I'll just give you the straight numbers, that RevPAR would be about $43 in 2020 compared to $87 in 2019. And this is for the total US. Um, so quite a big drop. And we are forecasting a pretty big bounce back in 2021, but not to 2019 levels. That's definitely going to take several years. So do we think the 80% back to norm normal in 2021 is and I, I know that's predicated on all things tied to vaccine and the, um, the, the things reoccurring, but is that what you're anticipating in terms of a rebound in 2021? I would say that's probably optimistic. Uh, we yeah. forecast a 63% increase in RevPAR in 2020, or 2021, I'm sorry, 63% increase in RevPAR in 2021. And mm -hmm. that was back when tourism economics suggested that US GDP would only fall 0.4% this year. They've okay. since revised that. They think it's gonna fall at least 7% this year. So I think at least for now, any revisions you see are going to be down, unfortunately. Okay, fair enough. So, you know, as we're talking about rebounding and we talked about standards in hotels, front desk, uh, you know, room service, uh, cleaning, what have you, but we didn't talk about event space or uh, the, 
what is being discussed in terms of banquets and food service in the future uh, in, the, in detail. And I know that you're, you're, everyone's trying to figure that out right now, but is there any insight, John or, or Norm, that you all can share with us in terms of what that thinking is? I, I, I know that, you know, as I talk to Greg and the folks at and Melissa Riley, my vice president of convention sales and services is on the phone, We've got citywide still on the books uh, in August and September and October and beyond. We've got three major medical and Norm's shaking his head because everybody's telling us they're all going to cancel. Yeah. And um, you know we all are holding on, but we you know but we're we're realistic. But at some point, we hope that we'll be able to 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 see business come back to the city and to to our space. So, what are you all looking at in terms of that that meeting space? criteria and, and food and beverage and, and how are you looking at it? And I know you don't have a finite answer, but I'm just kind of curious. And that was one of the questions that have come across what you all are talking about at this point. Yeah, that's a tough question, Elliot. I mean, in terms of our meeting space, I mean, we, you know, we already have it. So <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Right. <laughs> So, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, incumbent upon us to figure out how to, how to get business flowing back into the hotels to, to keep it filled up. So we can't, we can't unbuild it. Uh, uh, you know, that's, that's as good as I, I have, in, uh, unfortunately. Elliot, let me throw something out. Uh, I, I can tell you what we've been, we've been working on with our operating teams and, and our hotels um, are generally, generally smaller. We have a few hotels that are pretty big. Um, 800 rooms, 750, 450, but most of our hotels are average 200 rooms, um, about 20% are resorts, and one's behind me, that's Key West, I wish I was there, um, and I wish there were people there, um, since they ordered, Key West, the Keys ordered all the hotels to close, um, they're literally not allowing people uh, who don't live on the island to come on the island uh, right now. Uh, we hope that's lifted by the end of May. But what we're looking at is, first of all, um, meet outside uh, where you can. We have a lot of properties, even some of our urban properties have outdoor areas, um, whether it's courtyards, whether it's rooftops. Um, we have outdoor dining, um, uh, outdoor bars in many cases, particularly in our Southern California locations. And so these are, these are venues that I believe customers will feel much more comfortable uh, meeting in. And that'll allow us to bring back some of the smaller groups, maybe five to 25 or, or even 30. I mean, we have resorts with hundreds of acres um, right. where people can meet in the woods. Um, and, and so I think that'll be part of our focus. The other part will be, um, in some cases, using our restaurants and our bars as meeting venues. Um, because they may not be open as restaurants or bars and, and where people can spread out and not feel like they're in a big meeting room with just a few people. They're in a different venue that feels more comfortable, maybe a little bit more like their home or, or a typical restaurant that they would go to. So that's really our focus is how do we, how do we get the small group uh, in, into our properties, um, small weddings uh, where people don't want to wait any longer. Whereas I think the bigger weddings, they're, they're going to have to wait till next year in, in most cases. So that, that's yeah, really absolutely. The, 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 going to be our focus. And, and of course, people, you know, the, 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 the RFPs we're getting right now suggest, you know, three people to a tent top and, and, you know, your six foot long uh, 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 meeting uh, tables where you can only have two people at it. So you know, now whether those groups will actually come under those circumstances is very different than an RFP. Yeah, and I, I think the two, one thing that I heard as I talked to a um, general manager of a big box hotel whose name I will not use is that basically as DC is looking at a, a tiered approach to reopening based on some of the criteria, the bigger box hotels will not be able to make that it's, it's almost unrealistic for them to try to reopen based on some of the criteria that might come out in the first round of opening, um, simply because they, it, it's, it's, it's difficult from a cost perspective. Um, and, and we know that that's going to be a concern as we're making recommendations to the city in terms of reopening and, and, and those concerns. So 
Um, and then also, you know, as we look at the, you know, Kelsey talked about the fact that the demand for the higher end hotels um, clearly would be, is down right now for those that are still open. Um, you know, there is a train of thought that, you know, they're, they're known for the level of service that they offer um, that is tied to butlers and, and individuals being in place to, to service the, their guests. You know, what are your thoughts or any, for any of the three of you um, in terms of how they're going to be able to survive based on all of these new limitations that might be in place? I mean, we, we have some casual luxury hotels. Um, one of them actually is open in Naples on the beach. And uh, right now we're getting five, $600 rates and the services are pretty limited. So I, I think the customer's expectations will change dramatically. They're not looking for high touch. They're looking for no touch. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's really what will define luxury for some period of time. Yeah, yeah I, I think that I tend to think the luxury hotels ultimately will hold up just fine. I think that what you're going to find is um, a lot of hotels that are closed today, or it's not a lot, a significant number of hotels are closed. They probably won't reopen, but they're on the lower end and, and perhaps never should have been built in the first place. Uh, and, and I think that'll ultimately help to, to balance the supply demand imbalance that we have in place today anyhow. But you're, you're going to see some buildings repurposed as I don't know, residential or, or, or what have you, and uh, w which I think will be healthier for, for the industry uh, going forward. That, that won't have as much impact on maybe some luxury hotels that John might own, but, but really on sort of the mid-tier, uh, I think we'll have a healthier, healthier performance of all hotels once some of that excess supply is flushed out of the, the system. Yeah, Elliot, I don't, I don't think the issue is luxury. I think Kelsey said it. It's, it's your, I mean, think about our, our highest rated Customers are oftentimes our, our citywide groups um, and, and our corporate accounts. Yep. And that business right now is going to be replaced for some period of time by leisure and by discount leisure. And, and so I, I don't think it's people not willing to pay for luxury. I think it's just the segments that are being impacted by the virus. Yep. Yeah, and I think as I look at the question, um, that came across, it was along the lines of the expectations are tied to, you know, full service uh, in a lot of varieties when you're staying at a five-star hotel, if you're paying $700 a night um, or, or more, um, you have expectations tied to that. And um, will that level of service be expected? You know, the reality is it shouldn't be based on what we're dealing with, but that's that's always a concern and how, how will the, the luxury brands have to possibly rethink what they're offering so that they still are offering, you know, there's nothing worse than someone staying in a high end hotel saying, come downstairs and get it yourself. Uh, you know, your, your expectation is you, ring, you, you call up and before you hang up the phone, it should be there. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting how they, how they deal with that. So Kelsey, from your end, you know, research is, is relatively finite in terms of what you're analyzing based on, weeks past, but as you're looking at the future and you guys are now probably being asked all types to analyze things that you've never been asked to do before. And I'm curious, um, what, what should we be asking you guys to analyze or what types of things are coming your way that, that um, cities or, or hotel groups are asking you to look into as, as we look at rebounding from where we are? Well, I think a lot of times in downturns like this, our initial response is to look to past downturns. So, okay, what happened in 2009? What happened in 2001? What happened in 1991? Past downturns. And that's not really as relevant today. Even your historical performance two or three years ago isn't as relevant today. What we are looking at very closely are other markets and comparisons to other markets, very specifically China, because China is uh, several weeks ahead of us. So we can maybe see a potential future for us and how China is performing right now today and say, hey, maybe that'll be us in a month or six weeks. And we've kind of found that to be somewhat the case, definitely following the same downward trend. And we are starting to see, we're calling them green shoots there. Things are opening up. Um, travel is coming back online a very little bit. So I would say look to not just 
historical performance or not just your comp set or what's happening in your market. Look broader than that. Fair enough. To the two gentlemen, if you, as now that we have Kelsey as a, as a target audience uh, on this call, what are you all thinking about from a research perspective that perhaps you might be thinking that you'd want to know or analyze um, that might be different? And I know that's kind of a pie in the sky question, but I'm just kind of curious, is there something that you're thinking about? Yeah, look, we have, a, a, surprisingly enough, we have a couple of development projects uh, in, in other states. And these are three years off before you ever put a, a shovel on the ground. But it, it sort of forced us to, to think about product. Uh, it's forced us to think about design and uh, trying to anticipate what the needs are going to be sort of going forward. Uh, you know, it's kind of shrinking shrinking certain, you know, services and uh, back of house and meeting space. We're, we're just thinking differently than we were uh, two months ago, trying to anticipate the unknown, but, uh, but that, that's what's required if, if we're, we're gonna be able to get these, these projects up and, and, and moving uh, in the future. Makes sense. John, anything from your, from your end? I mean, the, the, the only thing we've been looking for is is better data on uh, real demand versus, um, you know, a lot of the weekly data that comes out is, um, doesn't necessarily show all of the hotels that are closed. And, and so some of the percentage changes are probably overstating, well, understating the decline uh, at this point in time, because I think the way Smith Travel works is it's 30 days for a hotel to be closed before it's sort of taken out of inventory. And, and so if we can get the hard demand data, which we get on a monthly basis, if there's a way to get that weekly, that, that's, that's helpful. Particularly, you know, it's interesting what we're now looking at. We look at, you know, TSA publishes daily um, uh, screenings, right? So screenings, for passengers are down at, at the bottom they got down to 96 percent below last year they've rallied on a huge percentage basis up to to 93 percent um, down and but those changes of one percent or two percent matter as we track this recovery and we decide when do we reopen these hotels because we've all looked at our models now and determine where we need to be from an occupancy perspective to justify reopening and not losing more money than staying closed um, as we bring some people back. And so that kind of data would be helpful. Yeah, John, you're not the first person to ask for that. <laughs> and it is something we are actively working on. Just no, no, I know. You are I, aware. I asked Amanda. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yes. All right. And, you know, I've been scrolling through some of the questions. We've got five minutes left, and there, there are some real specific questions that um, I'm sure that, that uh, Neil and his team will get to you all to maybe answer with those individuals that are asking the questions because they, they deal with uh, contracts and cancellations and things of that nature that we all love to hate or hate to love, whatever. Um, you know, there's, there's always a concern about uh, residents in D.C. Um, being employed, and I know that both of you um, that uh, are here are, are, are actively involved in making sure that Washingtonians are given opportunities to work within your individual properties. And um, I, I see Norm shaking your head and John, I feel like um, the, the Pebble Brook and the, and the hotels you all have here, that's somewhat your mantra. So I would, I would, if the mayor was on this call, I know she would say, please make sure you always continue to consider Washingtonians as we look at rebounding. Um, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I want to, to talk about real quickly in terms of hotels and, you know, sometimes when we're talking about uh, the economic impact of tourism and conventions and folks say, well, why are you always talking about hotels? And I have to remind a restaurant that someone physically staying in a hotel will more than likely eat three times a day, especially if they're on business travel and they're going to go out and drink and do all the other things. So as much as we promote restaurants and tourism and, and nightlife and all these other variables, which is what we do. It all, the economic impact is tied to individuals being able to come into Washington and stay in your property so that 
So John will continue to look at us uh, more positively and Norm will want to open more hotels in, in an industry that um, continues to thrive. I know there are a lot of projects that you all are probably, that, that you had in your mind that you were thinking about doing in the future. Is anything now on hold because of where we are uh, with this pandemic from a national perspective? Well, <clears throat> it is for us. I mean, we've, uh, in, in fact, we, re we release our earnings in 35 minutes um, for, the, for the first quarter and there'll be some things in there, but we've already announced that we've, we've postponed a number of very substantial redevelopments within our portfolio. Um, the good news is those are in other places. Uh, Elliot and here in DC, um, we're redeveloping the Mason and Rook Hotel into the luxury Viceroy Hotel. Um, we're, we continue to employ the construction workers and we thank the city for continuing to have the inspectors come out uh, and do their inspections so that we can get our work uh, complete. We're doing the same thing with the Donovan Hotel, um, which is Caddy Corner on Thomas Circle. This is a really exciting hotel for DC. Um, it'll be called Hotel Zeno when it reopens. There's already a six-story mural painted on the exterior by a Washington, D.C. artist uh, who, we, who we paid to do that mural. And inside of the hotel, the narrative is really a celebration of the women's right and fight for equality. And uh, we, we've commissioned artwork from all over the world, artists from all over the world, uh, uh, in partnership with the, uh, the National Museum for Women of the Arts. And we'll be reopening that hopefully this summer, um, but the work is completing and, and we hope to you know, staff that hotel up as we're done. Yeah, all right. Um, our development projects I mentioned earlier, they're so far out that we're gonna continue to uh, plan those projects and assuming they remain feasible, we'll push forward with those. Uh, 2019 was a, a pretty, uh, robust year in terms of capital investment for us. Uh, we had a number of projects planned for, uh, for this year, all of which are, are on hold and uh, uh, won't be completed for the, for the foreseeable future. 